Happy 2019 everyone, Dave here and I thought I'd start the year off with a little Q&A. So I put the call out to social media for questions and now I'm going to answer them. A couple people across different platforms asked me if my opinions have changed on anything I've reviewed, uh, if I was too harsh or too lenient. Um, I was a little lenient on Florida Space Mountain only because I didn't remember at the time just how much better California's is other than the soundtrack. Uh, I was also really harsh on Duffy, but that was for the sake of a joke, just because I wanted to bookend that bit with Professor Farnsworth gags. In real life, I'm mostly just ambivalent towards Duffy. I have no quarrel with the existence of Duffy, it just doesn't do anything for me. I also didn't know about the original Journey into Imagination when I wrote the current version, so I was harsher on the concept of Figment than I would be now, but less harsh on the execution than I am now. Also, I was very nice to Jurassic World in that one movie later. Um, even at the time, I knew the movie probably wasn't gonna hold up, but I still stand by the assertion that that was a fun opening night viewing experience. But as far as I remember, there hasn't really been any like massive shifts in my opinions of an attraction since reviewing them. Um, I have gotten new information about some that have uh, recontextualize my appreciation for the attractions, or at least what they were going for. Like, a lot of people came to me with uh, more charitable readings of Chester and Hester's Dinorama, about how it's a uh, parody of Tacky Tourist Traps, and I do see the merit of that reading, but the problem is it's not a funny parody. Like, the experience is not actually better than a Tacky Tourist Trap, even if you claim it's satire. It's the cinema sins of theme park lands. On Twitter, MaskBluey9999 asks, How did you meet Tony? We met on the forums of a website that we don't like anymore, a channel that refuses to change, or at least refuses to atone for its mistakes that it made before it changed. Uh, there was a subsection on the forum where you could post your own video content, so I was posting Dave Does Disney there, not really expecting anyone to care, and then I discovered I wasn't the only one doing Disney Park reviews. And to my even greater surprise, I discovered that another guy doing Disney Park reviews was that guy from the comedy music scene who did that serious Black parody song a while back. So I went into his thread and introduced myself and shamelessly plugged my own videos, which was probably really rude of me, but he watched them and he liked them, and we had interacted a bit over the forums. But the first time I met him in person was when he came out to Florida to shoot the 30 Years of Epcot and ABC Goes to Disney World videos, so basically the first thing we did upon meeting each other in person was do an intense two-week film shoot. And surprisingly, that was actually a really good way to start a friendship. MaskBluey9999 also asks, Favorite and least favorite video you have done? The answer to both questions is all of them at various moments. Every video I've ever done has something that makes me cringe, and depending on my mood, I might find it completely unwatchable. But most videos I've done also have something that I'm still proud of. Uh, a couple other people, I think, asked uh, favorite videos of specific series, which is a little easier to narrow down, so we'll get to those questions in a little bit. On Twitter, my friend JD asks, You, Tony, and Charlie are stranded on a desert island. Who is the first resort to cannibalism? Who is the first resort to communism? And who is the first resort to turning it into a resort? Well, it has been canonically established that all it takes for me to eat Charlie is for me to dress up as Figment first, so I resort to cannibalism on Charlie before he can turn it into a resort, while Tony's off on the other side of the island doing a one-man communism. On Twitter, my friend Arthur Knowledge asks, The public needs to know, where did the concept of Artie come from? So we talk about this a little bit in the uh, Patreon commentary on the Artie saga, which we probably should do a follow-up for since he's had a few appearances since then. Um, but basically, when we were first writing the Glee sketch, we just knew we wanted the four-person dynamic to cover all the viewpoints and all the comedic angles we wanted to take. And naturally, when you're writing out-of-touch studio executives, one of them is going to be an out-of-touch, rich, old guy with no self-awareness. And uh, Nick volunteered to play that role himself. And uh, really, it just came about from, you know, we found the suit amongst our costume stuff, and we found those glasses, and he just started doing the voice. It just all felt right, right away. But uh, Nick says that the key to really getting into the character is the glasses, because they are not his prescription, so he can't really see the world through them, which is perfect for Artie's out-of-touch view of the world. As for Artie's name, that just came out of phonetics. It just sounded funny to say, Damn it, Artie, he's not a hooker! No other name felt quite as right. 
Arthur Knowledge also texted me a few more questions. What is your favorite bit you've ever filmed? Your favorite show riff? And what was the most difficult scene or bit you ever filmed? Favorite bit I filmed is probably the aforementioned Glee sketch. That was such a rush to do. We turned that around in under 20 hours and it still mostly holds up, I think, even though there are some lines I would probably rewrite now. Favorite show riff is probably Beauty and the Beast, just because that was the most fun I've ever had writing a video. It was just so much fun to watch that show over and over, watch the footage of the show, and just keep coming up with jokes. Because that show strikes the right balance of having plenty of material, like it's endlessly riffable, but it was also genuinely enjoyable, if nothing else than for the soundtrack. And the most difficult scene I've ever filmed is a scene from the finale of The Blitz Drive of Fornia, which I promise you will see eventually. But uh, as for the scenes that you have seen, probably the most difficult scene I've ever filmed is the end of the Fantasmic review, uh, just because that took a lot of pre-planning. We shot the bits with Charlie in Florida, then we shot the bits uh, with Tony in Florida a few months later, and then like over half a year later we shot the bits with me in California, and it just it just took a lot of planning ahead of time. Um, we actually, very fortunately, uh, shot the Charlie bits when he was in town. We shot them at a couple different places of downtown Disney, which turned out to be fortuitous because uh, most of the places we shot, uh, the backgrounds did not look the same by the time Tony got to Florida. So fortunately, at least one of our shooting locations, we were able to match when Tony came down a few months later. On Twitter, Space Sick Venus asks, what's the deal with airline food? Now, when I was a kid, my family would always fly United, and at the time, uh, the kids' meal on a United flight was just a McDonald's Happy Meal, uh, complete with a little uh, toy of Ronald McDonald in an airplane. So, uh, as an adult, I really haven't been on that many flights that actually serve meals. Most of the flights I'm on are a lot shorter than that. So, I always conflate the mediocrity of airline food with the mediocrity of McDonald's food. So that's my deal with airline food. What's yours? On Facebook, Matt Ramirez asks, I've always found your timing for jokes to be exceptionally sharp. How do you hone that skill? Well, first off, thank you. Um, it really just came from a lifetime of loving comedy. Uh, growing up as a kid, I just loved jokes and humor. Uh, I always knew I wanted to do something with comedy. Um, and I really loved just the rhythm of jokes uh, as a kid. There there were a lot of jokes I laughed at despite not really getting the joke just because I could tell they were said in a funny way. So I would imitate jokes phonetically and I would just memorize and repeat jokes from TV uh, and just really imitate the cadence of the things that made me laugh. So I think it was just a lifetime of growing up uh, just repeating jokes the way they were said, not just the words of the jokes, but the exact uh, intonations of the jokes, just sort of helped accidentally grow what apparently are decent instincts uh, for that sort of thing. So it, it's the way, you know, the way to learn a language is to try speaking the language, I guess. So in this case, the language was comedic timing, and I learned to speak it before I really understood it, and that just stuck with me. On Twitter, Haley asks, what's the most fun and the most stressful part of the process? The most fun part of the process is probably brainstorming, just riffing with myself, observations, jokes, and thoughts, and it's especially fun when a joke comes into my head fully formed, uh, like the uh, letter to Doc bit in the Barney video. That came into my head fully formed the second Mr. Peekaboo poked his head out that door. I was like, well, I know what I'm doing here. And the most stressful part of the job is Editing. Dear God, I hate editing. I wish I could hire somebody else to do it, but these videos don't even pay my salary, let alone another person's. On Twitter, Mikey Insanity asks, How many digits of pi can you recite from memory? Twelve. Just trust me on that. On Patreon, Curtis Charles asks, What's your favorite D-list or Dave's obsession? Well, obviously I'm partial to all the ones where the creator of the thing I'm talking about saw it and liked it, so you know, I'm proud of the Phineas and Ferb videos, I'm proud of the Pistol Shrimps radio video, I am uh, proud of the Comedy Bang Bang D-list, I'm proud of the Spontaneation D-list, I'm proud of the uh, Dorm Life obsession, which actually got previously missing episodes of Dorm Life re-released. Uh, I'm, yeah, anytime the person whose work touched me, 
gets touched by my work, that's so crazy and surreal to me that that happened, so I'm very proud of all those. Beyond that, I still really love the uh, King's Quest obsession and D-list. I think those are pretty underviewed, uh, even by the usual underviewed standards of my work. Uh, and also the um, Free Willy the Animated Series obsession. If you haven't watched this video of mine from a few years ago, I highly recommend you go back and watch it because if you don't know about Free Willy the Animated Series, you deserve to know about this. On Twitter, Jacob Miller jokingly asks, favorite 42 seconds of every movie based on a Disney ride? Since this is a joke question, I'm not actually going to measure, but I will tell you my favorite scene from every uh, Disney ride movie I've seen, which I think is all of them except the last couple of Pirates and uh, the Tower of Terror TV movie. So my favorite scene from the Country Bears is a gag where it looks like a guy sitting at an office, but it turns out he's just a fake office display. The reason that gag made me laugh so hard was I actually had the idea to do a similar gag with uh, kids in a kitchen, but it pulls back and they're just in a Home Depot kitchen display. Uh, I thought of that for a script that I never finished, so I was happy to see that gag actually get used somewhere. Uh, my favorite scene from the first Pirates is probably the skeleton scene, my uh, the first skeleton scene on the ship. My favorite scene from the second Pirates is the three-way sword fight. I don't care how little sense it makes, it's just cool. My favorite scene from the third Pirates is uh, Barbosa marrying Will and Elizabeth during the battle. Again, I just think it's cool. It still works for me. Um, uh, my favorite scene from Haunted Mansion is probably the graveyard scene. It's pure fan service, but it's decently executed fan service, even if it reminds you what a waste of potential the rest of the movie is. And my favorite scene from Tomorrowland is again reminding you of the waste of potential. It's the scene where she's in the commercial for Tomorrowland because that's the movie we were really hoping we would get. So it's cool to see that. It's just a shame that that's all we get of that version of the movie. Then Jacob asks more seriously what my personal favorite bit from a Blitztravaganza video is. From the Blitztravaganza specifically, I'm still proud of the sheer out-of-left-fieldness of kangaroos versus wallabies, as well as uh, in the same video, the completely random, off-the-cuff uh, Dinner with Andre reference I made talking to a bird at a table. It, it was just a bird sitting at a table, and two people at a table, I don't know why my mind goes to my Dinner with Andre, but uh, it worked. But probably the very best bit of the Blitztravaganza is uh, Nick's Knickerbocker rant, because that was filmed in one take. Uh, that came about because I had so little to work with on The Barney Show, so I was like, Nick, just watch this with me and brainstorm with me, see if we think of anything. And as soon as Mr. Knickerbocker played, Nick was just like, fuck this song! And I'm like, okay, okay, we'll put you in here saying fuck this song, and... God, he delivered on that. On Twitter, Tyler asks, what's the worst theme park show or attraction that I've had to sit through? Eighth Voyage of Sinbad. My least favorite thing at one of my favorite theme parks. I love Islands of Adventure. Eighth Voyage of Sinbad could be good with just, you know, one rewrite of the script. It's got so much wasted potential, and it's just the least bang for your buck. Catherine Carter asks on Facebook, I've been re-watching your D-list videos lately. Have you kept up with Crazy Ex-Girlfriend or Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? I am a handful of episodes behind on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend just because I'm busy all the time and don't really have a lot of time to watch television. Um, I fell off of Kimmy Schmidt, uh, like, I loved season one, I liked season two, I didn't get very far into season three just because, no real reason, I, ju I just slightly lost interest. I'll probably go back and finish it up at some point, but, uh, yeah, I, 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 I think season one w was still really funny. Season 2 was a little more hit and miss. Um, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, I think, is still fantastic. I just need to find the time to catch up on it. What would be your dream project? To design my own theme park, of course. Um, as far as a dream movie I'd love to make, um, a lot of the dream movies I want to make have already been made. You know, someone beat me to The Hobbit, and someone beat me to a movie based on Get Smart, so what does that leave for me? Well, there is actually uh, a project I've always wanted to do that would probably never get greenlit, uh, especially because it would have to be greenlit by Universal, and it probably just wouldn't be lucrative for them. I want to do a biopic about 
Trey Parker and Matt Stone making your studio and you. Nothing else from their life, you know, nothing about South Park or Book of Mormon, just the shoot for your studio and you, because the stories I've heard from that set deserve to be dramatized. As for internet video project, uh, I've been toying around with doing an obsession of the moment on this, but I feel like it needs to be bigger than just a single obsession because there's a lot to unpack in Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, uh, Aaron Sorkin's show about a fake SNL that I have this just fascination with, uh, a love-hate... Love-hate doesn't even describe it, it's like, I love what this show is, even though much of what this show is is terrible. Uh, it, I want to do like a full multi-part examination of that. On Twitter, Animat asks, what do you think makes theme park reviewing different from reviewing all the other forms of media aside from shooting on location? So the thing about reviewing theme park lands, especially in the uh, comedy internet review sort of review that's basically just an abridged mystery science theater, um, the thing is that a theme park land doesn't have the same built-in structure that a movie or a TV episode or even a video game has. Uh, a ride might, but a land doesn't really have a built-in beginning, middle, and end. So the biggest challenge in figuring out how to review a theme park is uh, how to structure it, how to format it. Uh, if you're reviewing the full history of a park, you can sort of go through the timeline chronologically, but if you're just reviewing the current state of the park, you have to figure out, like, do I just move from spot to spot, or do I lump types of experiences together? Like, you really have to figure out your structure, so even the shallowest, just like, jokiest, no substance theme park review on the writing stage, it's still going to have more in common with a video essay because you're figuring out what you want to say, how you want to say it, what you want to focus on, rather than just going through the piece of media in order and pointing and laughing at the things you want to point and laugh at. On Twitter, Ryan Walterson asks uh, of what my favorite Jim Henson Company shows aside from The Muppet Show are. I liked Dinosaurs as a kid, but I haven't seen it in years, so I don't know how well it holds up. Uh, as far as Henson shows I've seen in the past decade, I loved uh, Know You Shut Up from Henson Alternative, uh, largely because it was hosted by Paul F. Tompkins, who should be hosting everything. And even though it's been long since cancelled, Know You Shut Up still affects me to this day by having introduced Paul to Colleen Smith, who has been one of the funniest people on Spontanea Nation. Every episode she's on is golden. <laughs> Sam Ratner asks, how do you choose topics to do as D-lists? It depends on the list. Uh, sometimes it's like a show I love, a milestone is coming up for it, so I want to talk about my favorite episodes of the show. Sometimes it's just another topic I want to talk about that just lends itself to list form. Like, I've always wanted to do something about the myths about Connecticut, <laughs> like the, the, the lack of research about Connecticut Gilmore Girls did, and I think I was trying to work it as an obsession before I realized, ah, oh, this can easily be formatted as a list. So there are a couple things like that where it's where it's just a thing I want to talk about and it just lends itself to list format. So yeah, list ideas can come from anywhere. Sam also asks favorite movie in the MCU. Probably Guardians. Uh, I honestly like I enjoy every MCU movie, but I don't really rewatch them very much. But uh, Guardians one and two stick with me a lot, and I've, I've probably revisited them more than the others. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Guardians. And then Sam also asks, appropriately enough, favorite episode of Gilmore Girls? Tough call, but uh, off the top of my head, I'd probably go with Deep Fried Korean Thanksgiving. Uh, if nothing else, then for the wonderful antics of Cat Kirk. On Twitter, Mattman asks, how did you start Dave Does Disney slash The Blitz Ravaganza? So I go a little more in depth on this on the uh, Patreon commentary, but the short version is uh, I wanted to make just a simple, goofy vlog at Disney World, just me goofing off on camera as a lifelong Disneyland fan visiting Disney World for the first time, and it was probably just going to be a lot of me going, that's not what I remember, but uh, as I was editing it, I realized I had things to say, uh, mostly, mostly starting with the Pirates rant, which then expanded to like, well, I've got to bring the rest of this video up to this level. This isn't going to be one video anymore. This is going to be uh, separate videos for each parks. And uh, that uh, changed my life in some great ways and some not so great ways. And then Blitz Travaganza was just, I was nearing the end of my time in Florida. 
and I just went to all the other parks. I was like, okay, if I'm ever gonna review the other parks, I better get the footage for it now. So I just shot a bunch of B-roll, filmed all the live shows, and just filmed any quick on-camera jokes I thought of. And then when I moved back to Connecticut, I decided, uh, yeah, I'll edit the blitz. Stuff. I'll do the blitz extravaganza. I'll put effort into this. And again, still affecting my life to this day. Still working on theme park videos to this day. Did not know that would be a thing I would do for so very long. But hey, it introduced me to all of you, so that worked out. Uh, Matt also asked, how did you come up with the idea for the Mickey that antagonizes you? So that was as I was writing the voiceover, as the Magic Kingdom video was expanding, I realized that at a certain point it was going to get really boring and repetitive for me to just be like, this isn't how I grew up with it over and over. And I realized I was kind of coming off as pretty whiny in a lot of the videos, so I decided a character needed to call me out. Mickey just seemed like the obvious choice. I actually toyed around with a couple other Disney characters who could do it in case Mickey was too on the nose, but Mickey's voice is the easiest to do poorly but still have it come across as Mickey. Um, so yeah, at the start, uh, in his first appearance, Mickey's basically supposed to be the voice of the audience calling me out on my shit, but since he has such an abrasive tone, it became easy for him to just become like basically a sitcom rival for me, which was a lot of fun to write. Uh, Matt also asked, how do you come up with the jokes for the riffs? Some of them just come to me uh, just right away when I'm watching uh, the show, but uh, for stretches where I need a joke and none are immediately apparent, I sort of ask myself a few questions uh, when I'm looking at a scene. First question is, what's the funniest thing about this moment? Like, like, what's the thing about this part of the show that I'm trying to draw attention to? Like, is it a weird performance or weird wording of a line or a weird, a weird choice made by the piece of media itself? Uh, second question, I pull back, what's the funniest thing about this scene? And if I have nothing there, I pull back, what's the funniest thing about this show as a whole? And that's sort of how I come up with running gags. So like, the funniest thing about this scene help me fill in a lot of gaps in uh, the Be Our Guest section of the Beauty and the Beast riff because I was like, well, the two things that keep sticking out to me about this are I don't know what those background dancers are supposed to be and Belle's not actually eating anything. So uh, those became running gags that I could just sort of work in whenever there was a gap that I didn't really have much else to riff on. Uh, finally, Matt asks, what's my favorite of all the theme park videos I've made? Uh, Fantasmic. Got to work with some dear friends, and the combined powers of me and Tony and Charlie led to something pretty special and something that still makes me laugh. On Patreon, Michael Hamilton asks, Megatron or Starscream? Okay, so aside from The Ride, the first three Michael Bay movies, and Lindsay Ellis's Whole Plate series, the grand total of Transformers media I've watched is probably less than 15 minutes cumulative. I have not seen very much Transformers anything. So I'm gonna go with Megatron just because of the meet and greet character. On Twitter, Chandler asks, of all the new Orlando attractions that have either already opened or are going to open within the next few years, which are you most excited to experience? Uh, of everything that opened since I've last been in Florida, the big thing is Diagon Alley. I hear it's amazing, I'm excited for it. Uh, I also want to see the non-dress rehearsal version of New Fantasyland. I want to check out Seven Dwarves Mine Train. I want to actually eat at Be Our Guest. And uh, I am also curious to check out Pandora, even if I'm indifferent to the franchise it's based on. On Twitter, I, Barry Carson asks, do you recommend any other theme park reviews other than Spaz and Tony? Uh, so if you're watching the three of us, but not also watching Haley, you are only doing yourself a disservice. Uh, Haley's Art Theory and Disneyland series is as good as everything we do, and quite better than a lot of the stuff I do, if I do say so myself. Uh, she is absolutely crushing it with Art Theory in Disneyland, and uh, Tony, Charlie, and I are showing up in that series a lot, so if you like us, you'll want to give it a chance anyway, just to see the stuff we do. Uh, I also really love uh, our friend Chris Nevergall, aka Tiny Mayfield. His series Remain Seated is brilliant. It's more uh, analytical video essay format than sort of riffy jokey review format, but it's really fascinating stuff. He really takes a film theory eye to uh, to 
all of your favorite attractions. He's talked about pirates, he's talked about mansion, he's talked about the Fantasyland dark rides. He is very good at this, and uh, I cannot sing Chris's praises enough. He's also just a really cool dude. And if we're expanding the question beyond just video, I really love Podcast the Ride. It's uh, Scott Gardner, Mike Carlson, and Jason Sheridan, and uh, it's... It basically hits that sweet spot between my two biggest obsessions, which are uh, theme parks and the L.A. comedy podcast scene. So, you know, a discussion about what it's like to go to Disneyland and a discussion about what it's like to perform at UCB. You know, everything I love. Um, if you uh, watch Defunct Land, you've heard uh, Scott, Mike, and Jason's voices in the um, the Disney's America episode as some of the, the Ken Burns style voices in that. Um, and if you've ever seen the Funny or Die video with uh, Patrick Warburton doing the roller coaster safety spiel, that is a video that Scott wrote. So it's that level of theme park geekery, of course. And uh, Scott also made my two favorite YouTube videos of all time, which are the uh, Pac-Man movie trailer and the documentary about the Beatles from the year 3000. Look those up if you haven't seen them. But uh, relevant to the question, he's one of the co-hosts of Podcast The Ride, which I love. It's very funny. It's great stuff. They did a whole 19-part series on CityWalk Hollywood, which they released one a day for 19 days in a row. It was amazing. It was intense. I don't necessarily recommend starting with that. I do recommend starting with their live show from last year where they talked to Tony Baxter. That's right, they talked to possibly the greatest living Imagineer. And yes, I did that too, but I was in character as a scary farm monster, so it doesn't count for me. On Twitter, Maggie with OJD asks, who's your favorite Disney dog? The one who has the keys, of course. On Twitter, The Slaper asks, what story of Tolkien's mythos would you like to see as a movie? I think you could do a really charming animated short based on the adventures of Tom Bombadil. Not Bombadil's chapters from Fellowship, I mean the, the poetry collection, the, the poem, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, I think could translate to animation pretty well. And as for a feature based on Tolkien's work, uh, it's not part of the Middle Earth mythos proper, but you could also do a really fun uh, family movie based on the Father Christmas letters. On Twitter, JC Nightwing asks, what do you think is the most underrated attraction of all time? Maybe Mystery Lodge? I mean, it's highly praised by people who go to Knott's, but since Knott's is already one of the most underrated theme parks of all time, it stands to reason that its greatest attraction would be the most underrated attraction of all time. So, yeah, I'm going with Mystery Lodge. On Twitter, WayCool64 asks, any good tips for creating theme park videos? Uh, if you're shooting on location, plan everything out ahead of time, but still allow for flexibility once you get to set. You don't want to leave anything to chance, anything at all. You want to make sure you have everything prepared, but at the same time, you have to go in knowing that some of the locations you want will be inaccessible, but also that some other happy accidents will occur and opportunities will come up that you didn't see coming. So you definitely don't leave anything to chance, but you take chances when they come. Learn to roll with the punches, but prepare for the punches just in case. Way Cool also asks, will we see a Dave Does America series where I visit some of the more U.S. parks outside of Disney Universal? Uh, and I assume you mostly mean outside of, you know, Florida and California. And I hesitate to promise anything while I still have an unfinished Blitz Travifornia, but I really would love to do uh, more parks across the country. I'd love to take some road trips and visit some of the uh, parks that are in less uh, heavily populated theme park areas. So I'd like to. I don't really have the time or the budget to do that right now, but uh, I don't know, maybe a Patreon stretch goal. Because, you know, we all know how good I am at fulfilling those. On Twitter, Time Warp Angel asks, what extinct Disney attractions would you like to bring back if you could? Any of the beloved Epcot attractions that I never got to experience, things like Horizons and the original Journey into Imagination. Um, I would also love to bring back a Florida's original confrontation because I never got a chance to ride that either. And don't get me wrong, I love Florida's Revenge of the Mummy. It's great, it's one of my favorite roller coasters, but I wish I had a chance to see Kong before they gutted it. Was Two and a Half Men ultimately a money laundering scheme for Charlie Sheen? No, but it was for Amber Tamlin. She was just playing a very gradual long game. 
If you could add any three countries to World Showcase, which ones would you pick and why? I think the biggest priority in adding countries to World Showcase should be uh, covering regions of the world that haven't been covered yet. Like, there are entire continents that aren't in World Showcase. You know, we don't really have anything from South America and, you know, like, Australia seems like an oversight. Um, and we need more for Africa than just Morocco and a bridge. Um, now, now that World Showcase is sort of shifting into more of a blend of uh, fact and fantasy, something that I would think would work really well for covering Africa, uh, assuming they can, what with the Universal Contracts, they could do a Wakanda Pavilion that would sort of both cover a lot of real African culture while also drawing in tourists who are, just go to Disney World for IPs. But if you do want to stick with real world countries and just pretend that Norway didn't turn into Arendelle, um, the key ingredients, I think, for a World Showcase Pavilion are a country with distinct food and recognizable architecture. So I feel like India is a no-brainer for a World Showcase edition. If you had to choose an American sitcom to be remade by British audiences, what would it be? Well, we remade The Office, so it's only fair that they remake Parks and Rec. Who or what inspired you to start making videos? I've been uh, trying to make videos, short films, movies, basically since I was a small child. Um, most uh, aspiring filmmakers of my generation all have stories like, Oh, I saw Star Wars as a kid, and that's when I knew I wanted to make movies. The thing that I saw as a kid that made me know that making movies was an option was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. There, would, there were a couple of episodes where he would show behind the scenes workings of the show while you were on it. Basically, they'd move the camera sort of off the normal set and into the soundstage. And as a kid, I'd see that and think, Mr. Rogers has a broken house. But I gradually started to realize that he was teaching us about making a TV show. And that was what led me to realize that TV shows and movies are things that people can actually make. So I've always been making videos, usually sketch or short films, attempts at narrative stuff, um, or just videos that people ask me to make for them, uh, some of which from high school you can see on Patreon. Um, but uh, it wasn't until I discovered this whole, you know, internet comedy review scene that I started thinking of, like, oh, there's easier ways to make videos that don't quite require always getting together a full production. It can be just you and a camera, even though I tended to go with a more interesting location than uh, just the bedroom, other than, you know, for videos like this. But it, it, it expanded my uh, sort of viewpoints on what sort of videos I could make. So it was the combination of the lifelong dream and then just seeing other people do things that I thought was funny. All right, those are the questions I got from social media. Uh, if you have any questions for me, you can leave them in the comments or leave them on Twitter or Facebook, however you get in touch with me. Uh, if there's interest in doing this again, maybe I'll do this every couple of months or so. And until next time, have a happy 2019. This is Dave, signing off.